right here. Let's just try and start this over. How about that? All right. Um, oh, is that like a doggy or a kitty cat up there? It's a big old bobcat. <laughs> oh, jeez. Hello. How are you? That's shy. Oh, my little shell cat is over here on the chair. Um, F cat Fitzgerald is her full name. So here's what's going on. All right. Um, point value uh, that we have left. All right. Um, if we can uh, talk about that. All right. Um, the point value that we have left includes a, uh, a, our final paper, obviously, uh, the final exam. And then uh, next week uh, we'll do, I'm going to leave it up to um, you guys. Uh, I, like, we'll do like a Soviet style democracy here, okay, where I will present you with the choices and you can vote all you want on the choices, but I'm going to present you with the options. So very, very Soviet uh, in its, uh, in, in its democratic style. Um, so what we can do is this. We can either next week, um, since we have quiz four left, but we lost basically a week and a half of class because of the change to remote online. Okay. So um, we're not going to be able to get all the material out that I wanted to get to, but it's not the point of just shoving material down your face. That's not the point of the course. All right. Um, so here's what I'm going to leave up to you guys that we'll get a little voting going um, on uh, either I'll ask in you individually on email and stuff. I don't want to make it public because I don't want to put that pressure on people and then have everybody boo at their uh, Zoom screens at, at people that they don't um, like. So um, here's what, what we want to do. Um, here's what I was thinking. Either we have quiz number four next week uh, and then we'll have quiz four, final paper, and then final exam. Or, uh, or here's the other option you can vote on. Uh, I just smush the quiz for material and points into the final exam. And we just combine quiz four and the final exam. And then you're not taking quiz four and the final exam. You're just going to take the final exam with quiz four material in there. And the point value will remain the same. So you'll just, the rest of this class, you'll just have final exam and final paper. What are you guys thinking? All right, so think about that. Uh, I saw some eyes light up on that, like, ooh, okay. Um, you know, so that, that could be something. Let's think about that uh, for this week, okay? And then maybe we can come back in here on, when we get back in here on Thursday and see um, where our votes lie on, on that, okay? Whether you guys uh, are yay or nay on um, kind of not canceling quiz four, but just kind of combining quiz four in the final. Cool? I've got a question. Yeah. Yes, Emily, go ahead. Um, if we combine quiz four in the final, what would be our time limit be? Oh, it would be uh, extended uh, to the point where I probably would be comfortable with, um, with, uh, going even over and above what would be uh, the normal exam to our time limit. I would be, I would be, I would be more than comfortable with that. Um, the, the, you know, the normal exam time limit is two hours. Um, I was going to, even if we didn't combine quiz four in the final, I was going to give you guys um, extended time anyway, because of the remote environment and the online craziness uh, that is, this world right now okay so what i'm thinking is is i uh, you know either making it three uh three hours to complete it uh or at that point i might as well just be like give you infinity time to complete it but i don't like that i don't like having infinity time to complete it because then um there's just some there's some ethical things that might get involved in that situation um, of, of giving unlimited time from my perspective. Does that make sense at all? Um, yeah. Let's just say, Emily, you guys will have um, 
more than enough time to complete it uh, comfortably. Okay, thank you. Sure, no problem. That's, um, a, that, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's a, a great question. Also, when, when is the date of the final exam? So final exam, guys, what I'm going to do is, uh, if you're looking at your calendars, um, final exam week is uh, May 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's final exam week. Uh, what I would do is I would uh, make the final exam available to you starting that Monday to be worked on any time during that week uh, to turn in uh, any time between uh, May 4th and May 8th. Okay. Um, I won't sort of set a time. I'm not sure if classes are doing that. I'm, are some professors doing I, I'm not, I don't know what's going on out there. We're, the, the communication between professors as to who's doing what on this thing has been, um, I, I think everybody's kind of, you know, and, and this is human nature. A lot of professors are kind of awkward and they don't want to tell everybody what they're doing because then they're, they're kind of afraid of judgment from their peers about, well, I'm doing this. So huzzah, I will look down my ivory towered nose at you. Um, but you know, so we don't, um, we're not talking very much about how our individual classes are going. Uh, but back to your point, um, you'll have the entire week to work on it. All right. Um, I think that's about as fair as I can get on that. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Great. Um, other questions. This is very. This is this is good. This is question time. Anybody else got anything going on? Um, like I said, um, if you uh, um, if you want to um, send me draft uh, final paper, or you can set up individual talk times with me. A few people have already. Um, emailed me and said, Hey, can we have like a little, you know, a little individual five, 10 minute session talking about, um, uh, my paper perfectly acceptable too. Okay. Um, if you got any questions, having trouble kind of paring stuff down, having trouble, uh, maybe getting out exactly what you want, those types of things. Cool. All right. So don't hesitate to ask me about that at all. Um, good, 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 good. Everybody cool on that? For the most part, yes. Great. Um, what would you say is the latest we can give you a draft? Uh, I, I think uh, with the final paper being due the latest by the eighth, um, you know, if you wanted to send me a, a draft early on in exam week, if uh, th that I would be cool with that. That would be probably the latest I would accept. Um, a draft because I have other classes that I'm going to have to be getting stuff out for at that time. Does that make sense, Candy? So, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to send me a draft like that weekend going in, you know, May, May 2nd, 3rd, 4th, I'd be cool with that. I'd be cool. With, I'd, I'd love to read through what you got uh, and, and give you some pointers. Um, so, for the final paper, would, would that, would the latest that we could turn it in be 11.59 p.m. on that last day? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, and, and am I, am, am I going to be a hard guy and be like, I'm not accepting one uh, syllable of a paper after midnight on May the 8th? No. I mean, I'm, I am i wouldn't do that to you guys. But, um it's got to be pretty darn near close to being done in that May 8th area. Does that make sense? And then if you needed to send me an email and be like, dude, you know, I'm dying here. Can I get it to you through sometime throughout the day on a Saturday? Yeah, I'd be cool with that too. All right. It's just that I'm going to have a bleep ton of assessment to do that Saturday and Sunday in order to um, generate grades by the due date on Monday. Okay. Um, that's just from my perspective. Um, looks like uh, what I'm hearing is graduation uh, is being bumped to August the 14th. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about that or not, but it, it seems 
that that Friday, August the 14th, um, seems to be the date that people are zeroing in on for graduation, which would, we would kind of combine that with like the next day would kind of be like opening ceremonies, opening convocation for the year, that type of thing. And then, uh, in and around that weekend, just giving you a heads up on, on some dates coming up. Um, well, like I said, all these things are very fluid uh, and contingent on uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, because I, and I, don't, I don't think this is being political at all to, to, to say that the uh, predictions and the modeling and things that have been used to try to predict this unpredictable virus um, have not been um, accurate <laughs> so far. <laughs> I don't think that's uh, uh, political to say that. Uh, you just, you know, can't be too careful though. And there's a lot, you know, it, I guess uh, the best way to put it would be um, you'd rather err on the side of uh, caution in these cases. That'd be my uh, point. Um, let's talk now a little bit about uh, the stuff that I want to talk about in the next uh, 24, 48 hours of chapter 11 in about, uh, you know, the uh, 10 to uh, 12, 15 minutes that, that we got left before I got to get out of here for, um, for another meeting. Um, the big thing that we got into um, and wanted you guys to, to, to get into for this week and this weekend um, is trying to um, get, uh, and we talked about this, uh, you know, that I wanted you to think about it over the weekend was similarities between university experiences and similarities between university students. And I gave you those documents to read about, um, you know, the university um, uh, statutes of Paris and um, student experience at the University of Paris, life of students, those types of things. Keep your thoughts there on, on those for for uh, for just a minute. But I do want to um, see if 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 I can't share my screen just for a second, um, and let me know if uh, the audio changes. One of the things that I've been experiencing seeing is when I share my screen, sometimes the audio goes haywire. Okay, so um, I can see a couple of you when I do a share screen. Okay, um, so keep that in mind. Like, um, give me like, a, if you can't see anything uh, or hear anything, like when I'm sharing my screen, uh, just give me like a thumbs down and I won't take it personally. Okay, I, I won't feel like you're booing the material. Um, but I do want to talk about the rise of the university. Okay, that, that's kind of where we're getting into right now. Uh, if you guys can see this. Um, this screen and all the rise of the university. Um, big thing that we want to talk about this week uh, would be uh, this situation. Okay. And the big question is it starts to change with the university where knowledge is seen to originate. Okay. Um, for most of the Middle Ages, there had been this Augustinian belief that knowledge came essentially from the divine and you had to try and just eke out little bits of divine knowledge that would trickle down to sinful humanity. However, after the Crusades and the rediscovery of lots of these ancient texts, this guy named Aristotle makes a reappearance. And the process by which truth and knowledge is acquired begins to change. Okay. Uh, the word is called empiricism, okay, or empirical data. And what that means is that, guys, this is kind of the, everybody thinks that the scientific revolution is where everybody begins to rediscover science. And that's just simply not true. The rediscovery of science and, and uh, things that you can believe in facts and tangible evidence, this starts with the rise of universities in the uh, 1100s and 1200s, and then gets built upon by the Renaissance and then the scientific revolution through the story of Aristotle and what's known as Aristotelian logic, okay? 
the big thing I want to make sure you have assessment, and I'm going to grade these notes um, on a video like I've done over the last couple of weeks so we can get more into this. But the big thing I wanted to get out today that we can talk about is the belief that you can derive knowledge by experimentation, by performing um, knowledge experiments, by, obser by observation. Okay, by observation and then accumulation of fact, that's Aristotle. Okay, so we talked about that trying to derive it from the divine, you build it from earth up, and then the building of knowledge through little accumulations of data and accumulation of data then reveals the divine. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, that's that's Aristotelian philosophy is you build and you build and you build and you build little pieces of knowledge here and there. And then by the end of it, you step back and you're like, oh, that's the divine picture. Instead of the opposite is, is sometimes called deductive reasoning, where you try to deduce things from the divine down to us. Okay, this is inductive. You build it up and then you say, aha, look at what I built. That proves the divine. Okay, this is how people start putting things together where they try to prove God. Okay, they try to prove that God exists. Maybe you saw some of those in chapter 11. Okay, we're going to talk more about those things on Thursday and Tuesday of next week. Right? And we're going to read um, what's known as the King KVA, which is the five proofs by St. Thomas Aquinas. I don't know if you ever come across those or maybe you've read through those maybe one, once or twice. Um, they're really interesting stuff where he kind of goes through five different ways. At the end of it, he's like, and thus God exists. It's just really interesting. Um, here's the thing, ladies and gents. The, the belief was that the monastic schools had become way too limited in scope. Okay, that people needed to broaden. Thus, the university system was invented. Page 339 is a big page here. You need a guild. Okay, and that's where I'll stop sharing for a second, just so I can show you guys what I mean by that. If you're looking for similarities to our modern world and to the medieval world. Okay, I don't think you really need to look much further than that word right there, guilds. Okay, guilds are very much a part of our modern world, even though we don't call them guilds. Okay, um, today we call them by other words like um, like unions or uh, you know trades, those types of things. So, for instance, you know if you're thinking about um, you know like my uncle belonged to the local 401 like like. Uh, or three, I want a pipe fitters union, okay? And in order to become a pipe fitter, you would have to sort of work and apprentice yourself as a pipe fitter, and then you could become a member of that situation. And then you would, the guild would decide, we're gonna go work on this and that and the other, okay? So it's a very, um, it, it's kind of like a, it does in many ways stifle, um, <coughs> Is kind of free economic movement, certainly. Okay. Um, so for instance, the, the point I want to make for universities is you guys can't uh, just get up in front of class, you know, like John was trying to earlier today when, when my internet went out, right? You can't just, you guys aren't, you guys aren't ready to get up and teach a class. Okay. Because not that you're not as smart as I am. Many of you in here are probably way smarter than, 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 than I in terms of just if we took a test. The point is that I have matriculated my way through the guild. Right? I have earned pieces of paper thrice that tell me how smart I am. Okay? You guys don't have any of those pieces of paper yet. You're earning them. Okay. And it doesn't, like I said, doesn't mean you're not as smart as me. Okay. Or that you guys don't write just as well as I write or speak, but you can't do it because the guild doesn't recognize you yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the university. Okay. So one of the cool things that I want you guys, you know, as we get into this and we start talking about the, you know, the liberal arts and those types of things is, um, one of the interesting things that they that they would do in medieval universities and in universities up until very recently, all right, is you would accumulate knowledge throughout your stay at a university. And then in order to progress the next step, you would have to challenge the professor to, in essence, a debate, 
or a, an academic duel, all right? And then questions would be kind of posited to both challenger and professor. And then a panel, a group would sit there and be like, yes, that, that apprentice has, has done well in challenging his, his, uh, his master. And thus you would get promoted to the next level. Does that make sense? Okay. You guys don't do that anymore. That'd be, that would be pretty cool. If, if, if by the time you're seniors, you would be like, you would go up to me or McNutt or somebody and you'd be like, I challenge you to this. And then you would, you would have to, we would have to come out there and it would be like a dorky historical UFC fight and everybody would show up and, you know, you, we would, we would sling historical knowledge back at each other. Um, that would be fun. I would like that. But the thing is, is guys, that, that keeps, not only does that make the student, that keeps the professors on their toes too. That makes sure that the professors are constantly learning. And so, so, these, so these, uh, these situations became really, um, really uh, productive areas of uh, expertise and knowledge. Um, and one of the things I wanted to share with you, um, like I said, in the last five minutes that we got here, um, I do want to uh, share um, another uh, aspect of uh, the screen here. Um, and, and this is very helpful. Uh, if you're looking in your book, there's an awesome map um, on page 342 that I'm going to uh, bring up here on the screen as well. All right. Uh, there's an awesome map on page 342 that's showing you the explosion of medieval universities and where they all were. Okay. And one of the cool things is that as these universities and your book lists the dates too, when they begin to spring up and where they are, all right, um, check out how many universities there are in what would be considered that Holy Roman Empire Germany region. All right. You know, there, there's some in Spain. There's a few up here in England, Ireland, decent amount in, in France. But as we move further west or east, excuse me, you get the main majority of universities are happening right in here, right in this um, Holy Roman Empire, Germany, Italy region. All right. Um, so that's where... Um, this is, guys, is, is the origination. People ask, well, why, why did the Renaissance begin in Italy um, and, and these regions? Well, here, I mean, let's just take a look at it. The, 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 the majority, the, the, the best and the brightest, the smartest minds of that time period are all kind of congregating in and around this region. Right? So it makes perfect sense that the Renaissance, this rebirth of knowledge, is going to come from this area. Okay, so maybe somebody, when, you know, when I ask you in the future, you know, why Renaissance happens in Italy uh, and these regions first, you can be like, well, for a couple hundred years, universities have been popping up there. I mean, that's obviously, um, uh, you know, a, a great uh, harbinger of inventions to come. One of the cool things that I also want you to, and the last thing I want to mention today before we take a break, is just as today, just as today you go to, um, and, I'll, and I'll come back and I want to share this uh, last part of the notes here um, at the bottom here, all right? In 1300, there were two dozen, I'll go over this later in more depth when I do my video notes. In 1300, there were two dozen universities. By 1500, there's 79. That's a lot. That's a big time growth, Okay. And if, to go from 24 to 79 official, and there were, oh my God, there were a bleep ton of unofficial universities, all right? Just as today, you know, there's all kinds of University of Phoenixes and University of, you know, Western East Central New Hampshire that you can get, you know, online degrees from, and some of them are trusted more and some of them are trusted less, and some of them aren't accredited and those types of things. Um, Guys, the same thing went on in the Middle Ages. You had official universities, you had unofficial places of learning, and hopefully you picked up how the church, and it talks about this um, on page 341. It's called this kind of the studi in, in Latin, the studium generale, and it, the, or the, the sort of general school. 
And the church, you can be for darn sure the church wants in on this because the church sees just as today, man, with universities, you see dollar signs and right? you see money. And the church is like, I'm getting in on this too. And the church sort of plops itself as it always likes to do right on top. And, and they're like, well, the Pope will decide which universities are the best universities. And so if you got that Studium General title from the Pope, you were like, oh, yes, that university is a very, very, very prestigious university. Just as today, you guys, we're going through an accreditation process at Thomas More. We had the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools on campus earlier this semester before the bleep hit the fan, and they were sort of going through our classes, and they were interviewing us, and they were making sure that our university meets all the standards so that they can give it their rubber stamp and say, Thomas More students know their stuff. Okay, and you can trust that their faculty is good. Uh, these things have gone on, guys, for centuries. Okay, school to develop um, specializations of practice, just like to um, where would you go today? Like, where, where do like you know the best lawyers go? You know, if you it, like, if you're a lawyer and you're like, I went to this college, like, where what are some of the ones you guys think about? Harvard, yeah, that's like the first one that comes to mind, like, like. One of the big things that like convinced everybody that Obama was smart was because he wrote for the Harvard Law Review. Oh, well, he is brilliant, all right? Because you just have certain colleges that give off this, this situation. In our current world, it's he or she went to the Ivy League. Well, oh, the Ivy League. Um, it's it just those types of universities. Okay? In this era, in the Middle Ages, if you wanted to be like, in the ranks of theological theologians, like the best theologian university. If you wanted to be a lawyer, like into the course of law in the Middle Ages, the best place you could go, as you can see from the bottom there, was a place founded in 1088, the University of Bologna, right? Or uh, more properly pronounced, Bologna, okay? But, you know, I like to call it the University of Bologna because, you know, they taught lawyers and the lawyers are full of baloney. <laughs> um, if you wanted to, to go someplace for medicine, okay? You went to the University of Salerno in Italy, okay? And as time goes on, developing specialties, okay, and those types of things. It, you know, today, for instance, um, maybe you have buddies, you know, or, or friends that are really good at engineering, you know, or, or those types of things. And you go to UC, UC's got it, or, or the best one probably in this region is Purdue. You know, if you get into Purdue for engineering, you're like, oh, geez, okay, uh, that person's on, like, the fast track to success, okay, um, those types of things, um, you know, and we also do it athletically, we develop these guilds athletically um, in, in our modern world, like, if you play football at Alabama, it's like, oh, oh you know, watch out, uh, you know, you, you're on the fast track to success, Softball, baseball, same thing. Like if you play, if you if you go to Oklahoma to play softball, you're like, you're pretty good. All right. And Thomas More. Thomas More is, you know, probably the best. So um, what I'm going to do is, like I said, you know, I'll post this. You can look at this later to, to get uh, so, some some notes, some looking at this, some some highlights, some announcements. Uh, the biggest thing, guys, is I'll send out um, a. Uh, uh, kind of a schedule of what we want to do for the rest of this week, what we want to have a discussion with on Friday, uh, and not Friday, excuse me, Thursday. And that will include um, some more specifics with um, not just uh, what we read with our uh, university statutes that I've linked, but I'm going to put a couple more uh, links out there and just see what you guys think about those uh, for Thursday. Then we're going to bring to a close these notes because I'll have narrated them for you to look at and watch before Thursday, if possible. Like I said, uh, I know that I'm not the only class you got. All right. Um, and then we're going to move on to some things in chapter 11 and 14, where we look at how people try to prove God. And then we will finish our course next week by looking at the cathedral building process and the differences between Romanesque and Gothic cathedrals. So those, that's where um, we're gonna finish up. I wish, like I said, I wish we had that extra week and a half that we lost, you know, um, that week and a half that we lost knocked out 
uh, the the Black Plague, basically. All right, um, which uh, you know would have been, I guess, kind of cool to talk about living in the modern world, even though this isn't really a plague, but you know it's somewhat of an epidemic, even though it's not reaching epidemic numbers quite yet. But you know, we'll see. Um, uh, if you got questions, comments, concerns, those types of things, let me know. Okay, All right. Um, uh, until then, ladies and gents, uh, I'll post this later. Send out some things to do, and then uh, I'll look forward to seeing you all. And I'll get the uh, I'll get comments and assessment out on quiz three and your forum post this week, so you'll have a really good. Uh, look at where you stand going into the final week. Cool? Awesome. All right, cheers guys, I'll see you uh, Thursday at 11.